Hello everyone, and welcome to this special episode of Pulp Crazy. I'm Jason Aiken. In this episode, I will be reviewing and discussing the recently released Tales of the World Newton Universe from Titan Books. This is a World Newton anthology edited by Win Scott Eckert and Christopher Paul Carey. It features fiction from the legendary science fiction and pulp writer Philip Jose Farmer, as well as those who are following in his footsteps. To my knowledge, this is the first collection focused entirely on World Newton fiction. Many of the new stories are making their mass market debut and the older farmer stories are back in print for the first time after many years. It's wonderful to have all of these stories available in one collection for the first time. This is a thick book, and you really get a lot of bang for your buck, both in quality and quantity of the diverse fiction set in the World Newton universe. You might be wondering what the World Newton Universe is and what it has to do with the pulps. I would highly recommend you read the introduction to this collection by Win Scott Eckert and Christopher Paul Carey. They explain this very well. Though in brief, I will say, World Newton gets its name from the real-life rural English village, in which... On December 17, 1795, a meteorite landed nearby. Philip Jose Farmer discovered two coaches passed by the crash site, and the coach drivers and passengers, whom some were already of heroic stock, had their genes further enriched by the ionization of the meteor. Some of these passengers, and many of their descendants, would go on to be legendary heroes and some villains. Their families would later intermarry, further strengthening these genes so they would become dominant and not recessive. Farmer would call this group the Wold Newton family. He first discussed them in his biographies, Tarzan Alive and Doc Savage, His Apocalyptic Life. Both Tarzan and Doc Savage are World Newton family members. Additionally, Winscott Eckert would later coin the term of the World Newton Universe. This is used for tales that take place in the same universe the Wold Newton family inhabits, but they do not include any Wold Newton family members within them. Also, the stories of the Wold Newton universe are thought of as taking place in our own world. Like I said, their introduction to this collection is much more thorough. You can read it for free at SF Signal or by downloading the sample of the Kindle version from Amazon. I'll be sure to put a link to both in the show notes, as well as the book itself. So, what type of fiction is included in this anthology, and how is it? That's what I'm here to tell you about. I won't go into any big spoilers, but I will give an overview of each story and add a little bit of commentary and reference. I should also note that both Eckert and Carey include many introductions to each individual short story in this collection, which is also very nice. The first section of the book is titled The Great Detective and Others. And the first story featured in this section is The Problem of the Sore Bridge, among others. 
This is a tale by Philip Jose Farmer that features Raffles, the gentleman thief, and his partner, Harry Manders. Farmer writes this story as Harry Manders. The piece is done in the style of a Victorian detective novel, but with science fiction elements. Raffles and Manders are investigating three cases at the same time Sherlock Holmes and Watson are. These are three cases Sherlock Holmes was never able to officially solve. In this story we found out why that is the case. This is very enjoyable and it blends Victorian mystery and science fiction superbly well. If you like Winscott Eckert's Avenger Trilogy, I highly recommend reading this. This story has some ties to its three Avengers tales that are published in the Moonstone anthologies. The next two stories in the Great Detective and Others section of the collection are Ralph Von Wow Wow tales. He's an anthropomorphic dog detective. Philip Jose Farmer wrote these under the alias of Jonathan Swift Summers III. The pieces are A Scarleton Study and The Dog Whose Bark Was Worse Than His Bite. I haven't got around to reading these yet, but I have to admit they do sound kind of fun. The next section of the collection is titled Pulp Inspirations. There's no big surprise that this section was something I have really been looking forward to. All of the tales in this, in this section are written by Philip Jose Farmer, and I haven't been able to read any of them until this collection came out. The first story is Skinburn. In this tale, Farmer focuses on Kent Lane, the illegitimate son of the Shadow and Margot Lane. It seems to take place somewhere in the 1960s, possibly the early 1970s. Lane is a private eye, but he works for a government agency called CACO, C-A-C-O, the Coordinating Agency for Cathedric Organizations. Their nemesis is Schizo, and it's unknown what that stands for. This is a combination of a hard-boiled mystery story with espionage elements. Lane has found that his body is breaking out in sunburn whenever he is exposed to the sunlight, hence the title. In addition to the burns, he also comes under a feeling of ecstasy during this process. He's also been getting phone calls whenever he is about to go to bed with various women. This is pretty cool, and it had a neat ending. You were right there with Lane the whole time, and it's kind of fun to try to piece together what is happening to him and who is behind it. The second story in this section is one of my favorite farmer written stories. It's titled The Freshman, and it's set in H.P. Lovecraft's Muscatonic University, and it's tied in with the Cthulhu mythos. Interestingly enough, a reference to a witch doctor from Edgar Rice Burroughs, The Jungle Tales of Tarzan, is also made. The story was inspired by a dream that Farmer had. The main character is Roderick Desmond. He's a 60-year-old freshman who is just enrolling at the university. He is a known and accomplished occultist, and he has a nagging older mother who's in her 80s, and she still can't let him go. He soon discovers a powerful professor and his fraternity wish to take him on as a student and a member. This is a really good story. I was very impressed with it. Um, this was what, written way before the time of Harry Potter. But I think anyone who likes the Potter books would find this interesting. 
Uh, there's some really cool world building that got started here. Uh, Farmer makes references to a few Cthulhu Mythos deities. Um, I believe a farmer wrote more stories set around the Miskatonic University. Uh, it would be just as well known today in popular culture as Hogwarts is. Um, I'd say Muscatonic University, many people in fandom know about it, but Hogwarts has kind of become a household name thanks to the success of Harry Potter. And I think if Farmer would have maybe wrote this as a bigger series, uh, he probably could have put Muscatonic University even more on the map than it already is. The third story in the section is After King Kong Fell. It deals with the climactic escape, rampage, and fall of the legendary King Kong. This was actually a pretty touching piece as Farmer goes into some pretty deep thought regarding the events of the movie and novel. The story is framed with Tim Howler, who was 12 years old at the time of the event telling his granddaughter his first-hand account. It is pretty touching at times, and I imagine the interaction between Howler and his granddaughter must have been inspired by similar interactions between Farmer and his children or grandchildren. Also, for pulp fans, Doc Savage, The Shadow, and Margot Lane make cameos towards the end of the story. The next section is titled, Wool Newton, Prehistory, the Cocarsa series. It contains one novella, co-written by Philip Jose Farmer and Christopher Paul Carey. It is called Quasin and the Bear God. It is set in the Empire of Cocarsa, in Tarzan's ancient Africa, circa 10,000 BC, in a lost Bronze Age. If you have read Hayden of Ancient Opar, you are familiar with the bronze giant Quasin, the wielder of the Axe of Victory. Quasin, an exile and enemy of the King of Kokarsa, encounters a priestess of the Snake Totem in the ruins of an ancient city. He spends the night with her and accompanies her back to her village. There she gives him the ultimatum. Help her sister, a priestess in a neighboring village, save it from the king's men. Or she will turn Quasin into the village's priests, who were followers of the sun god and allies of the king. In turn for helping her sister, she states she will put in a good word with the queen of Dithbeth to absolve Quasin of his past crime which was supposedly ravishing a temple priestess in Dithbeth. He reluctantly agrees, and the story really starts to pick up from there. This is a classic adventure story, in the vein of Robert E. Howard, Edgar Rice Burroughs, and H. Ryder Haggard, but with modern sensibilities and style. Carey does a great job building on Farmer's previous world-building of Kokarsa and its people. This novella, aptly named, deals with the Bear God, which is fitting as Quasin is of the Bear Totem tribe. Bears play a big part of the story, and the Bear God himself has ties to much more than the just this story alone. This includes Philip Jose Farmer's authorized Tarzan novel, The Dark Heart of Time. This story reminds me a lot of classic Conan stories, where the chronology really doesn't matter. Uh, where Conan comes across a situation, and he deals with it in his own way. In the case of this story, I believe Quasin out Conan's Conan, as he appears to undergo quite a bit of character development from the events of this story, especially in coming ter to terms with the gods. If you enjoyed this, I recommend trying to find a copy of The Gods of Opar. It is an omnibus that came out from Subterranean Press, and it's now out of print. 
It contains the first two Opar books, Hayden of Ancient Opar and Flight to Opar, as well as The Song of Quazin by Christopher Paul Carey and Philip Jose Farmer. The Song of Quasin is the conclusion to the Kokarza trilogy, and at the moment is only available in the limited edition Omnibus. Quasin and the Bear God takes place between the first and second chapters of the Song of Quasin. I'm a big fan of the Kokarsa series, and hope to see even more in the future. The next section in this collection is titled World Newton Prehistory. John Gribbardson in Time's Last Gift. The first story in this section is Into Time's Abyss by John Allen Small. It is hard to talk too much about Into Time's Abyss without giving away the ending to Time's Last Gift, but I'll try. This story branches from the main World Newton Universe timeline, as it involves the same time-traveling team from Time's Last Gift, but they are actually the second versions of these characters who travel back in time. A unique time loop occurs in the original novel that makes Gribbardson, the main character, believe that the second team would appear on a parallel world. Small uses this as a launching point for his short story and nails how these characters would act when put in this type of situation, especially the tension between Gribbardson and the Drummonds, a husband and wife, where the wife has taken a little too much of a liking to Gribbardson in the eyes of her husband. Gribbardson is the star of this story, and, as in Time's Last Gift, there are some hints at his true identity. He really shines in this story, showing his ability as a natural leader as they encounter the native people of this time period. A nice twist occurs at this moment. While Time's Last Gift was a bit of a lost world story, set in Earth's past. Into Time's Abyss is more like a sword and planet story, set on the past of a parallel Earth. Gribbardson and his team encounter a race of aliens, who seem to be a cross between human and lions, and they ride mounts that are a cross between wolves and bears. They are giants and incredibly strong. Gribbardson, never one to back down from bullies, throws in with the humans, and it's a lot of great action from there. The only downside to this short story is that it's so good it could be the first chapter of a book. As a reader, I am begging Small to continue this story. I want to know where and when the story takes place, as well as more background on the aliens. It's just a top-notch story from start to finish, and I'm really waiting for more from this. The second story in this section is The Last of the Garanays. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And it's by two gentlemen called Octavio Aragao and Carlos Orsi. Again, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing their names. This is a tale of John Gribbardson in the main World Newton timeline. It takes place in the 17th century in South America as Gribbardson inspects the site of a natural nuclear reactor and encounters the various people inhabiting the area. This is a pretty unique story. It reminds me of 1930 science fiction pulps, where the science was very well researched and integrated into the story. Of course, since Gribbardson is involved, it also brings the writings of Edgar Rice Burroughs and Philip Jose Farmer to mind. 
I especially like how the authors delve into Gribbardson's soul in terms of religion. That deep down, even under all of his knowledge and education, he still carries a respect for the primordial hunter god that he believed in when growing up in the jungle. I thought that was a really nice touch. I also like how they had Gribbardson go into Johnny Weismuller, broken English, Tarzan mode, when he was playing his part as Puri, the titular last of the Garanes, in order to woo a Portuguese girl. Like Smalls, in the Times of Best, in the Times of Best, rather, Aragau and Orsi have contributed a great addition to the John Grubbardson mythos. The last section of the book is titled World Newton Origins slash Secrets of the Nine. It contains a novella called The Wild Huntsman by Winscott Eckert. As the section title implies, this novella takes you back to the day the meteor crashed in World Newton, England. Through the eyes of John Gribbardson, you were able to view all of the major players who become the founding members of the World Newton family. You also see Gribbardson's primary antagonist and how his past relationship with Gribbardson has an effect on the entire World Newton universe, as well as the Secrets of the Nine alternate universe, which features Lord Gruneth and Doc Caliban. I would say if you haven't read a World Newton story, start with Time's Last Gift by Philip Jose Farmer, then read this short story. The Wild Huntsman stand on its, uh, stands on its own as an entertaining and informative novella that covers various aspects of the Wool Newton universe. From here, you can let your reading branch out in various directions, depending on what aspects of the Wool Newton universe you are interested in. Whether it is the Tarzan and Kokarsa Opar cycle, Doc Savage, uh, Phileas Fogg, Victorian heroes, French heroes, etc. Overall, I rate this collection a 5 out of 5. Um, I would even like to give it a 6 if that was possible. It's that good. The quality of the stories, as well as the selection of these stories, is second to none. I really hope Titan will continue to at least put out further Wool Newton anthologies like this. A collection this great, this diverse, definitely deserves a follow-up, in my opinion. I'll be sure to link to the book, ebook, and SF Signal post in the show notes. If you have ever been curious to see what World Newton is all about, now is the time. I would recommend buying Time's Last Gift by Philip Jose Farmer, the new edition from Titan Books, and this, Tales of the World Newton Universe, to start you on your journey. That's it for this week's episode. Pulp Crazy is located at pulpcrazy.com. I'm at Pulp Crazy on Twitter. And facebook.com slash pulpcrazy. You can also email me at pulpcrazy at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.